Uh, our first paper is entitled Cubic Space, a Reliable Model for Proportional, Comfortable, and Universal Capture and Display of Stereoscopic Content. Our speaker is Nicolas Routier, who is the finder of MindTrick Innovations, a Montreal-based company focused on strategic advising and technology development. As a tech entrepreneur, Nicholas develops next-generation 3D image capturing and processing technologies for extended reality, as well as glass-free 3D displays. Nicholas. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk in front of uh, so many 3D lovers and people that are uh, really uh, experienced in stereoscopy. And um, I've been in 3D for the last 20 years. I've uh, co-founded a company called Sensio Technologies, and we're doing a lot of 3D image processing. We worked with uh, in digital cinema, and we worked uh, with 3D TV manufacturers. And one of the key takeaways, by the way, this presentation is going to be a bit different than what you're used to. This is, I'm not from academia, I'm from industry, so it's going to be a bit different, but still, <laughs> you're going to get uh, pretty much the essential. So. Uh, a lot has been said about the demise of 3D TVs and what caused it and the challenges, and some people would say it's about the glasses, it's about uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the fact that people don't like 3D, but my personal take on this, and this is something that resounds uh, everywhere, is, is the lack of 3D content. And the question comes, uh, when you start asking yourself the question, you say, why is that content so scarce? And did a lot of research in the literature to try and find you know, what exists in terms of how to create 3D content. And still today, we're relying on empirical rules of thumb to say, if you do the towing like this, if you use the cameras like that, you will get some 3D effect. You should follow these rules, and you should get something that looks good. And everything is very relative in terms of what is good 3D or not good 3D. Uh, but one thing is for sure is that today with these rules, we often get compressed or flat 3D. We will get uncomfortable 3D experience for some people for different reasons. Uh, we cannot do sharing, easy sharing of 3D content for different displays. We cannot do panning or zooming like we do with 2D content. And this is very frustrating. So the question also comes from why is it so complicated? Where there's, there's a bunch of variables. There's a lot of variables involved in, in 3D. And every time you play with a single one of them, you whack up the entire thing. So 3D is extremely sensitive to very small variations on any of these things. And putting all of them together, the viewing parameters, the user parameters, the display parameters, and putting all of them together into a single model seem to be very challenging. So that's what we decided to tackle. We decided to start trying to figure out, is there out there a perfect geometrical model that could explain everything, put everything together, and would allow for a single capture, and then from that single capture, do universal displaying and sharing of that stereoscopic content. So when, what I mean by geometric model is to say if a person X with a distance between the eyes of Y from a screen, the object is at two places, then we can perfectly predict where the object is going to be located. And it's going to be exactly how it was captured. So three key objectives. First, proportionality, X, Y, and Z. This is why cubic space. We don't want something that's stretched or compressed. We want a cube. Second thing, universal adaptation for any viewer in any display, one at a time, or I'll explain further what I mean by that. And then comfort of viewing. This is more subjective, a bit more difficult to measure. Well, is, there are some ways of measuring, but a bit more difficult, a bit more tricky to, uh, to tackle, but we're trying to use things that are known in the literature. So in order to define the proportionality of the experience, we had to define what is that, X, Y, Z but we have to define it in mathematical terms. So the first thing is the depth scale. The depth scale is how deep we perceive in the real world, uh, in the observed world versus the real world. So if it's at 10 meters, yeah, I'm talking metric. <laughs> so if it's 10 meters inside, you know, the, an object is 10 meters in the real world and you see it using a screen two meters within the screen, then that means that the ratio is one to five. That's simple. 
The spatial scale is the X and Y. If, if it appears 10 meters wide or if it's 10 meters wide in the real world and you see it as two meters wide in the perceived world, then the scale, one, once again, is one to five. Then there's the proportionality scale. It's one divided by the other. If one divided by the other equals one, then you've got X, Y, Z proportionality. Otherwise, it's stretched or it's compressed. Very simple, pretty straightforward. Note that they don't have to be equal to, that. like you don't need the experience to be exactly the same proportion. Of course, everybody experienced in 3D knows that if you have two very close cameras, then you have, you film in micro, then it means that the depth scale is gonna be quite enhanced. Same thing for the width, you're gonna have an impression of watching a big thing uh, on the screen. So, starting with that, we decided to go parallel with the cameras, why? Well, because parallel cameras, it's well known, it's been demonstrated in literature, it's very easy to demonstrate that a progression, there's a linear progression in uh, between the disparity uh, on the screen and uh, the real world. In other words, if you have an object is increments of one meter in the real world, you have a factor of 0.5 in the scale uh, in the observed world, then that means that every increment of one meter is gonna be an equivalent of an increment of 0.5 meter in the observed world. So that's what's been used in VR, obviously, and uh, the thrust from rendering, that's one of the recommendations to get that linear progression uh, in, the, uh, in the depth. Now spatial scale is a bit harder, was a bit trickier to determine, because obviously an object that's the width in the real world is LR1, LR2, LR3, will appear to be wider at a different distance. But if you capture it with a camera and you look at it in 2D, well, these three objects, different width at different distances, will look exactly the same width. They will be presented on the screen, same width, no difference whatsoever. So in 2D, it's quite hard to determine. If you want to determine a real spatial scale, what you have to do is to say, okay, I have to put it in relation to the depth scale. Meaning by that, that an object that's at LSE2, right there, that, that width, if it's perceived at that distance, then we have the perceived width that is LP. So that's the concept that we use in order to determine the, um, the uh, spatial scale. Now the basic concept that we've used is to say, say that we capture with two cameras and we use a certain field of view and we present it exactly the same field of view on two screens centered on each eye of the viewer. What do we get? Well, we get a perfectly proportional in X, Y, and Z. We get exactly the same thing as what we've captured at a certain scale. So, for example, you have point OG there and point OD there, so you will converge here at point OP with a certain perceived uh, distance. This gives a per perfect proportional experience. Now, what if we work with a theoretical, two theoretical screens, S1 prime and S2 prime, of course, this is impossible because they will be one over the other, but let's, let's say for fun's sake that it was possible. What would happen then? Well, the thing is, we get the exact same representation. Mathematically, it's exactly the same. There's absolutely no difference between showing this here and showing this on these larger screen at a longer distance. So basically you get the exact same identical experience. Now let's, let's take this a step further. Now let's take these two screens and think of it differently. Think of it as, think of a single screen that's right there in front of you and let's consider it as the right part of the S1, uh, S1 prime screen. So basically, you take it as the left part of the, uh, uh, sorry, the right part of the left screen or the left part of the right screen. 
once again, the portion of the image that is shown here is going to show exactly the same proportional experience as you get uh, with uh, a single screen or, or as two screen, two parallel screens. So basically, theoretically, based on parallax and point of convergence and using parallel camera configuration, we can mathematically achieve XYZ proportionality uh, when the displayed field of view is equal to the captured field of view. That's number one. Or the portion that we're showing occupies the same field of view as it was occupying originally in the first field of view. Secondly, the IPD on, divided by the baseline, so the IPD, the, different, the distance between the two eyes, and the baseline being how far, how distant the cameras were, that will define the general scale. So if you have 6.5 uh, centimeters between your eyes and you, your two cameras were very close at 0.65, then you have 10x. You are basically blowing up the universe by 10x, but it still remains x, y, and z proportional, but 10x larger. And the experience can be adapted to any user by centering the captured image to each eye of the viewer. So if you have a kid watching a, another stereoscopic screen, he's got his eyes closer, we can readapt and put it in front of his eyes. If we center it right, he's going to have the same experience as an adult. He's going to see the exact same thing as the adult would see. Now, we've tested this. We've, we went, we, we used uh, cameras, dual cameras, we've used uh, we've used the uh, rendering, so we use a single camera that we've slide, so we, re we would remove all the issues with different lenses and different geometries. We use rendering to do the same thing, and we failed spectacularly. So we looked at the picture, and it did not work. It did not work at all, and I was pissed. So, so mathematically, it made sense. The convergence, I took my ruler, I, we, like, we measured everything, we looked at everything, all the results, perfect. The convergence gave us the exact thing. My dream was to look through a laptop and look at infinity inside the laptop and see the world as it's supposed to be. Well, no, it doesn't work at all, at all. So the, measured, the measurements were right. The comfort was only achieved when we arbitrarily played with the distance of the images and the width of the images. <laughs> and it's like it kind of defeated the entire purpose of the thing. So we had to theorize and say, what's causing this? So if convergence is correct, and we're still not seeing it correctly, the only explanation that we found was that there has to be a conflict of visual cues. Your brain will not accept the information that it's receiving. So we've had that, and we all know of that, the framing issue or framing violation, whatever you want to call it. So imagine that that baseball is supposed to come out of the screen. Well, guess what? Your brain sees that a frame is blocking that baseball. So your brain tells you, you know what? I'm receiving two conflicting information. It's supposed to come out from the from the, stereops the, the stereopsis or the parallax, but it's blocked by the frame. So the frame must be in front of the ball. I'm pushing it back. So that's how your brain works. Well, we theorize that versions accommodation conflict, which is well known for the issues of comfort, can also really affect your depth perception. There must be tons of literature on this, didn't find it, but uh, one of the things is it doesn't only affect the comfort of viewing, it does prevent your brain if, it's, if the, this, the difference between the, in, the convergence information and the focal or the, the place where your eyes are focusing, if there's a too big of a gap, then your brain will not accept it. So one of the, uh, in terms of comfort of viewing, EBU suggested 1.5 diopter, and there are a few different elements on that. We decided to adapt our model, say, okay, let's determine the maximum depth plane and a minimum depth plane according to that version's accommodation uh, conflict and to respect that 1.5 diopter. And once we do that, we modify the images. They're no longer centered on the pupil to respect the farthest, uh, the, the maximum depth line. We modified the width in a very controlled way, very precise, very mathematical, to push back uh, the elements to the minimum depth plane. And we said, let's test with that. 
So we did the same test, but using these new parameters to realize that this time we succeeded. We actually were able to reproduce very comfortable 3D on any screen uh, using this thing. Well, we tested on TVs, uh, phones, laptop monitors, etc. We've been able to adapt, keep it very comfortable. We've adapted to different IPDs. We haven't done it an extensive test on tons and tons of people, but we've done it with a few kids, our kids, poor guinea pigs. <laughs> So we tested on kids, we tested on people that have different IPDs, worked very well. We adapted even for VR 180 content, we're able to reproduce the same thing using uh, curved shapes, et cetera. So we've been able to adapt it to that. And we've been able to introduce zooming and panning functionalities. So basically you can have a 3D picture, zoom in, zoom out, and it works perfectly. So in conclusion, with cubic space, we've demonstrated that we're able, it's now possible to create a single file, a single video, a single image, and share it with friends, share it on different screens, have a single one readapted to be comfortable, proportional, and uh, to be uh, adapted to any viewer and any viewing condition. Thank you very much. That's more than the time that I had. <laughs>